WBUR Podcasts, Boston. I'm Daryl C. Murphy, and you're listening to The Common. The Hildreth Institute is a research and policy center based in Boston that focuses on equity in higher education. And they recently released a report that details how state-funded financial aid has failed to keep up with the cost of attending public colleges and universities in Massachusetts. The report finds that 8 out of 10 students attending a four-year public university have $12,000 in unmet financial needs each year. For 9 out of 10 students attending community colleges, that number is nearly $9,000 each year. There's a lot to talk about in this report, so we reached out to the managing director of the Hildreth Institute, Dr. Bahar Achman Emboden, and she's here with us now. Bahar, how you doing? Thank you, Daryl. Thank you for having me. Everything is going great. So, Bahar, thank you so much for being with us. Let's get into it. Tell us more about this report. So this report is a follow-up to a study we published last year where we looked at the state of our public higher education institution at a higher level. Mm -hmm. In this report, we are really diving into the financial aid that students received. And what we found is that it is not uh, at all competing with other states. While uh, many other states have boosted financial aid by an average of 15% over the past two decades, Massachusetts students have faced a 47% cut. Mm. So this is troubling. And tell me, how does Massachusetts compare to other states? So even though uh, we stand among the wealthiest state in the country, we rank 37th in Mm. terms of the financial aid we provide to our students. 37th. Exactly. Wow. Wow. So kind of lay out what that means for us. Like, how did we get to a place where we are so low on that list? Like 37 out of 50, that's that's pretty bad. Well, I think it first starts with the fact that the public higher education institutions themselves have seen a chronic disinvestment from the state in the last 20 years, Mm -hmm. which means that they've increasingly relied on student-driven revenue by increasing their tuitions and fees. So we also see that community college has increased tuition by 52% after adjusting inflation since 2000. Similarly speaking, uh, state four-year public institutions saw their tuition and fees increase by almost 60%. And that represents a $7,500 price increase, Mm. uh, which is a very important hike. So the report also mentions the complexities of accessing financial aid. Can you describe for us what does the system for publicly funded financial aid look like and how do prospective or current students go about accessing those resources? So what we've found out is that by not establishing a regularly funded and systematic state financial aid program, the state has worked to distribute the limited funding they get for financial aid in a highly targeted way, which has created a confusing and layered approach of more than 40 small grants, scholarships, tuition waivers. And what that means on the student side, uh, they have to navigate a website that lists all these programs that have very different deadlines, very different application procedures. Some of them are centralized, meaning once they apply to FAFSA, they automatically are eligible. Others, they have to actually connect with the financial aid officer of the institutions. So it's impossible for them to completely piece together how much they are going to be asked to pay out of pocket, how much they are going to be receiving in terms of need-based aid. And of course, an important one is how much they are going to have to borrow at the end to make up the financial gap. So, Bahar, I'm, I'm very curious to know, what are you hearing from students or you know, people on the ground working with students about all of this? So our sister organization, La Vida in Lynn, works directly with students that are often first-generation students, students from immigrant background. What we hear 
from them is that there is a lot of anxiety and fear approaching, you know, the end of your high school and trying to navigate the financial aid system at the state level, but at the federal level as well. And many of these students are lost. So some of them want to completely opt out of, you know, even going to higher education because they are worried of taking on too much debt. And others are needing quite a bit of support, understanding which grant they are eligible for, what they need to put in place so that they can apply on time and receive this grant. What we hear is students are confused it's a lot to ask from uh, from them and their families. These are teenagers we're talking about, right? Like typically. Typically teenagers, but even we see an increasing population that wants to go back to college, especially mm-hmm. community college. So even adults that are trying to navigate that on their own are having a hard time understanding what they are getting into. So there's definitely a need to simplify, to provide a simple message to students that uh, they can trust that there are affordable path to obtaining this higher education that won't uh, result in a death sentence, right? Like at the end of their journey. We're going to take a quick break, but we'll be right back. Did you kill Marlene Johnson? I think you're one of the first people to have actually asked. From WBUR and ZSP Media, this is Beyond All Repair, a new podcast about an unsolved murder that will leave you questioning everything. Somebody should be in jail for murdering my sister. A woman who's never been believed. As long as they think I have done this, then they're not looking for who actually did this. And that's what makes it a cold case. No, it's a botched case. And a search for the truth, once and for all. Wow, it just gets more interesting. Beyond All Repair. Listen and follow wherever you get your podcasts. Be careful. You're digging in a place that's been very peaceful for a while. Do it anyway. Dig. And we're back. So, Bahar, I want to get nosy and ask, what brought you to this work? So prior to Hildred Institute, I joined the non-for-profit world to just really support evaluation and research of non-for-profits. And I ended up working for a non-profit called Inversant that was advising very underserved families, first-generation students, immigrant uh, families to navigate this financial aid system. And what we realize is that we are asking a lot from them and that this is not a model that can actually fix the problem and that we need to address the systemic problems that are built into our financial higher education kind of landscape. Witnessing this firsthand uh, really motivated me to look at ways that we can address this more systematically and we don't ask those, again, who are the most kind of disadvantaged already to do such a large effort and jump so many hoops so that they can access higher education. People often talk about higher education as a way to level the playing field. What does the findings in the report tell us about that notion? What we start seeing is that Although higher education definitely has the potential of being the great equalizer, the increased dependence on student loans to finance it threatens that. This is not a sustainable approach because we are turning higher education into a vehicle of inequity rather than an engine of upward social mobility. And the way this works is that we are burdening those who stand to benefit the most from a higher education with heavy debt which then impacts their life and their adulthood, the the important decisions that they have to make in terms of where they work. Can they buy a house? Can they get married, have children safe for college, 
for their own children. So we need to ensure that, especially for those who come from low-income background, underrepresented groups, they need to have an accessible, affordable, simple path of attaining a higher education degree. Understood. Now, can you talk to me about the recommendations that came out of the report? The recommendations are around the notion that Massachusetts should recommit to the pledge it makes to provide all residents with the resources needed to attain a quality public higher education. We would like to see a clear and strong commitment to reducing this dependency on student loan by eliminating students' unmet financial need. Another critical recommendation we make is that the state and public higher education institutions reach a consensus on the adequate institutional funding level that would ensure that they run efficiently, but they also provide a high quality education. And last, we need to address the fact that students that their changing demographic, their changing needs need to be addressed with additional funding, additional support, wraparound services that are essential for them to actually complete the degree. And if all that is put in place, we would see the Office of uh, Student Financial Aid Assistance empowered to basically provide a website where there is a simple, understandable kind of path to accessing this aid. Mm. Have you had a chance to talk with anyone from higher ed or any state officials since uh, publishing this report? Absolutely. We've been in connections with a lot of both uh, senators, representative people uh, that are in the Board of Higher Education. You might have known that the Board of Higher Education, led by Chris Gabrielli, has conducted an audit of the higher education finance. They've come to very similar conclusions. We were very happy about that. So there's definitely a unique moment in time in our work now to address this inequity, to address the unaffordability of higher education. Uh, We believe that this is a unique time for the state to address and reverse decades of chronic disinvestment from public higher education. What will you be thinking about moving forward? So we've definitely looked at various uh, policy proposals with an equity lens, uh, seeing who's going to lose, who's going to win from these affordability and accessibility kind of bills that are out there. Uh, The Act to Guarantee Debt-Free Public Higher Education, sponsored by Representative Natalie Higgins and Senator Jamie Eldridge. This legislation will propose an affordable path by providing a tuition-free public education. It would also provide some new additional grant for palliative students that still have unmet need. So critical new funding that is currently available for the state could be used this way so that low to moderate income, often underrepresented students can go to college, cover their tuition and fees, and more importantly, the costs beyond tuition and fees that often have them to borrow excessively. Mm. Well, Bahar, thank you so, so much for taking the time to talk with us. You know, as somebody who is carrying a lot of student debt, I really appreciate this conversation. So thank you. Thank you very much for having me. That's Managing Director of the Hildreth Institute, Dr. Bahar Achman M. Bowden. And that's our show for today. Thank you so much for listening to The Common. Please hit us up on Instagram or Twitter at WBURTheCommon. We would love to hear from you. You could also email us at thecommon at WBUR.org. Give us a shout. I'm Daryl C. Murphy, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.